This is Think Tech Hawaii. Community matters here. Hey, welcome to Stan the Energy Man here on Think Tech Hawaii, where community matters. I'm Stan Osterman, your highly paid host here on Think Tech Hawaii. And uh, man, can you believe it's already the middle of December and there's only like one more weekend before we have to start unwrapping Christmas presents and stuff? This year has just blasted by. It's been a busy, busy year for everybody. An exciting year, kind of a troubling year in some cases for some people, but uh, just a lot going on, especially in my world, in energy and hydrogen world. A lot of good things have been going on in Hawaii. So what I wanted to do is start today's program off with uh, just talking a little bit about what's been happening in Hawaii. And uh, one of the good news things to report is last week I got to spend some time with Surfco out in Mapunapuna. And uh, they broke ground on their hydrogen station uh, a couple months ago, probably early September. And uh, I'm happy to report that the construction trailer's in place and there's a bunch of of uh, trenching being done, and it's it's a real construction site. They're off and working. Um, they're hoping they don't. Uh, Servco doesn't have complete control over the timelines, but uh, they're hoping to have that station up and running around April of next year, which is really good news. That'll be the first commercial station on the island of Oahu and in the state of Hawaii available for hydrogen. So everybody's watching that pretty closely, and we're really excited about it. And hats off to Servco and Toyota for what I say, bringing the chicken and the egg uh, when it comes to Honda, I mean, hydrogen vehicles here in Hawaii. So thanks a lot to Surfco and Toyota for doing that. We appreciate it. Another thing was our mayors all got together and they decided that it would be really cool to um, kind of, they're not creating a law, they're creating more of a policy guidance thing with all four mayors for the major islands getting together and saying, we're gonna have clean transportation by 2045. So they've all agreed to pull together and start working with their fleet vehicles and, and kind of driving um, as best they can towards a 2045 fossil fuel free fleet of vehicles and cars on the streets in Honolulu and all the other islands. And uh, they think that's pretty ambitious. And there was actually an article on today's Pacific Business or this week's Pacific Business News um, written by, let me see here. Um, it's the editor in chief's notebook. Oh, I saw the guy's name here. Anyway, um, it was it was kind of an interesting take because uh, he points out some of the things that I've pointed out before, which is we're we're a customer, we're not an uh, OEM or a, a manufacturer. And so it's nice to say we're going to have all these cars, but we don't make cars. We have to buy them from someplace, and the guys that make them have to supply them. And uh, we don't have control over that. So it's kind of tough to say we're going to have that many electric cars of hydrogen or regular plug-in electric cars by that point. But he does point out something that I think a lot of people miss. I'm going to read it. It says, uh, and come to think of it, 1.2 million electric cars means an awful lot of dead giant electric car batteries in Hawaii at some point. So what are we going to do with those? Are we going to recycle them? Where? How? The batteries at uh, Nissan Leaf weigh 660 pounds, and those of a Tesla weigh 1,200 pounds. So let's split the difference and say that there's 930 pounds per car. That means that in the future, there's going to be 1.2 million electric vehicles containing 1.1 billion pounds of materials like nickel, aluminum, cobalt, lithium, silicon graphite, lithium salts, and copper. What environmental impact will that have on Hawaii? And even furthermore, what about the impact of mining all that stuff in the first place? And that's just Hawaii, assuming that the rest of the mainland isn't also building up their electric vehicle fleet. So to think that um, we're just gonna jump into electric vehicles and, and be all cleaned up in a hurry, uh, I think is probably a little over ambitious unless we start cutting our fleets down to, a, to a, using car share and things like that. And thankfully there's things like that going on, but um, it's pretty ambitious. And there's, a, there's some other things to talk about too with batteries. Um, and we've had some of this discussion before, but. Thanks to this article and uh, another article I read this week, 
We're up to about number five or maybe number six large 18-wheeler truck companies that are coming out with large vehicles that run on electric drivetrains. Two of them that I know of are strictly battery. One is uh, kind of goes between battery and hydrogen, and two are strictly hydrogen with small batteries. We call them battery dominant or, high, or fuel cell dominant. So we've got about two, two fuel cell dominant, two battery dominant, and one smack in the middle. And the interesting thing is, as you start to look at how much the battery powered only, the plug-in only charging ones are, how much they weigh, that's where you really start to th see things. Using the batteries that we use in our vehicles now, I come up with about 25 pounds per kilowatt hour of, of energy in a battery uh, when it comes to vehicles. So for every kilowatt hour you need to drive that vehicle, you're putting 25 more pounds on the vehicle. And so when they say that um, a vehicle can go like 400 miles on their batteries, uh, I worked the math out on that and it comes out to around 42,000 pounds of batteries in a truck to get it to go 400 miles. That's a lot of weight in batteries. Your typical Tesla has 1,200 pounds of batteries and your typical Leaf has 660 pounds of batteries. So you can start to really see the scale, as I pointed out in the Pacific Business News article, that the amount of batteries you're using is, is huge. And the resources to make those batteries are still finite. So when we talk about energy security, um, we're buying our fossil fuels from a few limited places here, but when it comes to making all those batteries, you're also limited to where you're gonna get those, those elements, particularly lithium, which is most, mostly South America and mostly controlled by China right now. So we're gonna have a talk with our guests today about some of that, but some of the other things going on in the world, Proton on Site, which is uh, a company that makes literally all the electrolyzers that we use here in the state that I'm aware of, has just been awarded a $1.8 million contract to assume the lead role in a US government project to actually test the, um, the um, benchmark, the splitting of, uh, of water into hydrogen oxygen and get, get it as cheap as you can. Find the technologies that get it as cheap as you can to use electrolyzers to make hydrogen. And then it's a, one of the other articles here, and this is from um, Gas World. So it's a commercial um, uh, industrial publication called Gas World. And they say GM to ditch gas and diesel powered cars. And it goes on to talk about how they've also committed to electric drivetrains. So bottom line is the world's looking at electric drivetrains to at least take over a pretty good portion of uh, the market in uh, commercial trucks and in passenger cars. And it's going to make a pretty profound change in our nation and our state. And there's a lot of things we have to get ready for and look at. And that's what we'll be talking about today with our guests. But before we go to our guest, I'm going to run a little video here that uh, we just had produced by HCAT and uh, just wanted to show it to all of you so you can get an idea about hydrogen fuel cells. Hydrogen, the simplest element and also the most abundant. Hydrogen makes up roughly 75% of all mass in the universe. Hydrogen also powers most of the stars in our universe. So it's only fitting that it has come to be recognized as a viable alternative energy source. And we need alternatives because fossil fuels are problematic. They're messy, dirty, expensive to obtain and not secure. And they're limited. Hydrogen, on the other hand, is everywhere. Hydrogen can be produced from a wide variety of sources, including water itself, using other renewable energies. That means it's clean, really clean. As a zero emission fuel source, the only byproducts are water, heat, and electricity. Easily transported, hydrogen can be stored and distributed on a large scale as either gas or liquid. As a fuel, hydrogen itself is very light. In fact, hydrogen is 472 times more efficient by weight than lead acid batteries. And it isn't just for transportation. Hydrogen can also effectively produce and store energy for power grids. Hydrogen gas is transformed into energy within a fuel cell. As hydrogen passes through a fuel cell, electrons are released and an electrical current is produced and captured for use. Electric vehicle motors powered by hydrogen fuel cells are twice as efficient as gas or diesel engines. They can travel farther distances than lithium batteries, especially in heavy vehicles, and can last for decades. 
hydrogen-powered fuel cells are scalable to buses and commercial fleets such as trucks, trains, ships, and aircraft. Fuel cells allow for fast, easy refueling, and hydrogen can be easily adapted to current refueling stations, making it a convenient fuel source for everyone. It is a proven, safe, clean, and efficient energy source currently in use worldwide. Hydrogen is everywhere, including our clean energy future. So thanks to the folks at Hyperspective for putting together that video. We think it's a really good, concise way to talk about fuel cells and how they play a role, not only in the transportation sector, but also in the grid. So thanks to Todd and all the folks at Hyperspective for helping us put that together. So today on my show, as every Friday on my show, is my favorite electrical engineer. He's, he may not be the tallest electrical engineer or the the oldest electrical engineer, but he's my favorite electrical engineer over at Burns and McDonald, Mr. Ryan Woman. So Ryan, thanks for being on the show today. I really thanks, appreciate Dan. it. Thanks, Dan. I try and hold that title near and dear and, and, and you fend should. off as many other uh, aspiring doubles. It's, it's, it's tough not to, an easy. It's tough to easy. impress me, so you know you, you should hold that one real dear, near and dear. But um, let's let's keep on talking a little bit about transportation and hydrogen and things like that. And um, impress a little bit further, because you've been doing a little bit of work studying on this stuff. And and uh, what are your thoughts on, on hydrogen and electric vehicles? Sure. There's a, there's a realm that I play in as the electrical engineer, a little more grid oriented and, and playing with the electrons and as we use them in our houses and, and uh, the malls and such, where we're not moving around as transportation takes energy and, and we're and very mobile with that. So the place where we come together would be something like a electric vehicle that you're plugging in at night to, to recharge. Uh, really what you're doing when you, when you make that transition is as you're an electric vehicle with, with the battery, you're asking the grid to provide that, that energy. So while you may have stopped pumping gasoline into your car, and, and, and that's great for, for your own initiatives against um, reducing carbon emission fuels, you kind of just shoved it off on to, to the next person over. And then the grid right now, we're, well, we're not at 2045 yet. So if you have an electric vehicle, Last year, Hawaii, or at least the, the tri-state Hawaii for Pico, was 25% renewable. So that electric vehicle is, sorry to say, but it's really only 25% renewable uh, and 75% and uh, carbon emissions. And that, that's the, well, the hard truth for some yeah. people. So unless you have solar on your house and you're dedicating that solar to charging your vehicle, you're really three quarters gas burner. That you, you really you like. are, yeah. <laughs> but solar would be a good way to, mm -hmm. to charge that. Um, it, it's not possible for some people and, mm -hmm. and solar is still, still powering up your house. So where hydrogen comes into play is, is really nice being a highly energy dense transportable fuel. Similar to where oil is right now, it's, it's a very energy dense, it's very available to us right now. Mm -hmm. We still move it around with Tankers and barges, you know, large chunks of fuel. When you when you look at a tanker, that's from a kilowatt hour standpoint, immense, mm -hmm. massive. You're not going to see a lithium ion barge floating across because it want to just be so big yeah. and heavy. Whereas filling that up with hydrogen, be a ton of energy that we yeah. could actually. Yeah, keep and, and people forget that because when you when you really look at um, business cases and business efficiency. Um, when you look at transportation, it's considered a non-value added cost. In other words, to move your product from point A to point B, you're, you're spending fuel, but it doesn't really add value to your product. It just gets it where it needs to be to sell. So if you can make hydrogen on site versus taking a tanker truck and moving a fuel from point A to point B, um, and of course, in between there is a pipeline. If you have a pipeline, that's probably not as expensive as a truck, but more expensive than making it on site. That also reduces your your transportation costs and um, to move the fuel, mm -hmm. um, let alone burning the fuel in your vehicle. So, absolutely. It, it, the neat part about that, as well as compared to diesel or gasoline, you're not you don't have a refinery in your backyard mm -hmm. or, or at the, the gas station that's brought in. Whereas hydrogen, absolutely, 
can be made from water. Okay. Well, Ryan, we're going to take a quick break here, and we'll be back in 60 seconds and talk a little bit more about transportation, clean transportation in Hawaii. I just walked by and I said, what's happening, guys? They told me they were making music. It's R.B. Kelly. I'm your host of Out of the Comfort Zone, where I find cool people with cool solutions to problems that all of us face. Now, the thing is, we're really cool, and I only invite really cool people, but the thing is, I think you're kind of cool too, so I think you should come and watch. That Thursdays at 11 a.m. here on OC16 Television with Think Tech Hawaii. I'm R.B. Kelly, host of Out of the Comfort Zone, and I will see you next Thursday. Hey, welcome back to Stand the Energy Man on my lunch hour, as usual. So we're not taking away from anything. The weather's getting cold. I should have worn my long sleeve Aloha shirt. I was actually pretty chilly this morning. Anyway, back with Ryan Wubbins, my guest for today's show, talking about transportation and maybe some of the things you're not thinking about when it comes to clean transportation in the big picture. So we talked a little bit about, you know, how when you plug into the grid, you're not necessarily being clean and green. You're only about, at this point in time, three quarters fossil fuel and one quarter clean and green. So uh, what are some of the other things that we're thinking about here? When we talk about transportation um, and cleaning it up, what are some of the other factors that we're looking at um, to make Hawaii clean and green and l maybe even lower our just our fossil fuel usage? Sure. One thing to think about, and I, I hope I don't lead you too astray here on, on this point, but when we start removing the, the fossil fuel, let's look at oil exclusively mm -hmm. uh, in this sense. It's, it's an easier one to look at. When we start removing, let's say, the utilities use of that oil, there, when you stack a, a barrel up and you, you start refining it into different uses, gasoline, diesel, right. jet fuel, it's a lot of different products that come out of there. Even asphalt mm -hmm. is made sure. with, with the petroleum. So when we take out one chunk of that from the companies that are importing that oil, they are being very efficient with the whole amount of strings in, uh, that they can. So They're using the whole pig. They're using the whole pig, absolutely. Yeah. When we, as a utility or as uh, the gasoline users, are, we start to take away that completely. We don't look at this holistically. All the other users of that petroleum are likely to bear an additional cost mm -hmm. because that piece that didn't get used, it's got to go somewhere. So we're either shipping it back out, which would be very inefficient, or we're having to ship in only the ones, the parts that we need, which is also very inefficient. Mm -hmm. So this this energy model, it's, it's very big and complex from that perspective. So you want to take hydrogen vehicles and uh, electric vehicles together and you completely wipe out that gasoline charge. Maybe the jet fuel that gets made mm -hmm. becomes more expensive or the asphalt gets more expensive. So once we solve one problem, we, we yeah. got to be ready for that next piece because it, it'll come back. And, and we don't necessarily recover any of those ancillary products with like biodiesel or, you know, the, you may not get the same byproducts out of there to like naphtha or whatever to, mm -hmm. to really supply to the other, other um, industries. So... Yeah, that's an interesting, I, I think people haven't really thought through all the way. And uh, just like the tax piece, um, the more renewables we put on our vehicles and the less gasoline we sell at the pump, the less revenues the state of Hawaii gets to fix roads and things like that. So how are we going to start taxing vehicles and users for the road if it's not a gas tax? What are we going to do? Are we going to have a tire tax? Or are we going to have a, just a flat weight tax on your car that's a lot higher than it is now? because the heavier the vehicle or the you know, more wear on the tires gives you an indication of who's beating up the roads the most and start taxing that way too. Yeah, absolutely. I think taxes in big time will have to, to switch on how we, we go about taxing against energy usage. Um, everything's going to get smarter with time too, so I would mm -hmm. uh, assume, I'm just throwing out there, that the cars maybe would get taxed on a, a mileage usage 
be classified to, to that type of use. Um, start taxing people that are using that commodity, but I'm not sure. Um, I'm going to leave that one up to some smarter people. Okay. I'm going I'm to segue a little bit away from the energy for cars now and talk about something else that happened recently this, this month. And the governor um, started talking autonomous vehicles and literally um, wrote some policy letting the world know that Hawaii's open for business to test autonomous vehicles. And so as an electrical engineer, and I, I'm hitting you cold with this thing, so <laughs> <All right. laughs> I apologize. But, um, you know, from, from that perspective uh, and what you know about autonomous vehicles, how do you see that impacting our transportation sector now in terms of maybe reducing number of vehicles or... Um, making it more efficient to uh, to run those vehicles, and if we're going to do that, should we also be investing in like um, 5G networks instead of 4G networks and things like that? Yeah. So uh, from the engineering perspective, I, I'm a, a fan of the autonomous vehicles because, in theory, when it's mm -hmm. all working properly, it's it would be a, a quite a, a concert or orchestra of transportation. And then really engineering feet once everything starts working together. So I, I get really interested in it. You absolutely would be more efficient on your roads uh, once the sensors on the cars uh, reach a certain capability. Well, what's that capability that we that we say certain? Um, what would make you comfortable to have a, an autonomous vehicle to, to drive on the road? Some people say, well, it never can hit a person or do anything like that. Well, I'm going to argue the, a little bit lower of a point. What if every autonomous car was better than any human driver? Mm -hmm. What if that's the line? That line is a lot lower, but it's still much more achievable as a lot of us are terrible drivers. So as more autonomous vehicles comes onto our road system here, we have a very advantageous uh, control over the road system in Hawaii because we don't have to deal with interstate traffic. So I think there's some uh, opportunities of leverage of, of that different than uh, the mainland. But in the end, you're, you're going to be more efficient, see less, less vehicles, uh, which will put us more efficient on the fuel side, too. That's the way I kind of see it working, big scale. Would we need to maybe improve the qualities of our roadways? Do you, do you see us needing wider roadways or at least filling our potholes better and making the surfaces better? Because... These vehicles, although they'll they'll stop before they impact another vehicle and they're looking sideways and kind of 360 view, they're not looking for holes in the road. And I mean, let's face it, if there was a big divot in the highway and you dropped into that, that's not good either. And if you're a driver, you'd, you'd try and go around it. But mm -hmm. um, it, well, what would happen with the cars, your, your margins for error actually get smaller. So we would need less shoulder on the roads to have mm. the autonomous cars work together because the sensors are going to allow you and the algorithms will allow you to to drive closer at, uh, okay. with, with possibly increased safety as well. Mm. The the pothole part, you, you do need, your car won't be as capable as the infrastructure it's driving on. Uh, the autonomous cars are not making better driving cars. That's always progressing, mm -hmm. whether it's diesel or, or gasoline or battery or autonomous not. But your cars now are, are getting smarter as, from a system standpoint, that potholes could immediately be uh, detected mm -hmm. by the cars and reported back to the agencies that are responsible for fixing them. So the, the repair could be faster. Mm -hmm. Cars could know that a pothole is being fixed in a certain spot and maybe to avoid the road during that time. Now, everything is getting much smarter uh, at a pace, I think, a lot faster than people are, mm -hmm. are ready for. So let's try and just brainstorm some of the things that are a little different. Just like if you decrease the amount of oil coming into the state, how it had that ancillary effect on other industries. Um, mm -hmm. How about repairing roads? When you put guys out there with and put cones in the road and things like that, how will these autonomous vehicles know that there's those things out there besides the onboard sensors or... Will, will it be something like you said, a vehicle would say, hey, there's a pothole here, automatically report it to the repair people, and then the repair people broadcast out to all the cars, if you come to this location, you're going to have to come to these lanes. Is that something that they're looking at too, do you think? Yeah, so each each manufacturer, and there's, there's a lot out there, a lot of startups that handle all of those questions differently. 
uh, I'll start with one manufacturer that uh, many people are aware of, and, and this is their take on it, that if I just were to drive a car by camera, that's how you and I drive right now, is mm -hmm. just, just visually. We, Visual we do have sensors. an audible, mm -hmm. audible sensor that we're, we're detecting as well. Uh, a little bit on the grip on the steering wheel is going to give us some feedback. For, for the most part, let's just, we can be safe to assume that we're driving with our eyes. Mm -hmm. That's in one direction, and then we have to look at the mirror, look at the next mirror, look at the next mirror. So the argument from that company is if I were to add a camera in all directions, I'm already superhuman. Yeah. I'm already better than what you are if mm -hmm. I can add in the computing software behind that sensor. Mm -hmm. other, other sensors are a type of radar um, to go out and actually sense what's out mm -hmm. and around. The next part that's really tough is trying to predict what's going to happen with the information you receive. If you see someone on a bicycle, you and I both know, well, they might fall over. They might mm. turn left. Or I know that people on bikes like to go to that store over there and constantly turning left. It's mm. much harder for the software to detect that. And they make the assumption that that bike, if that's a bike, they might fall over or they could move really fast. Or maybe it's a bike stand and there's a bike sitting there. Mm. Does the car stop because afraid of a bike right. falling over the bike stand. That's the hard part for mm, okay. uh, manufacturers right now. For the cones in the in the road, it's going to really be uh, an AI that is operating just like you to detect those are people, mm -hmm. those are cones, I need to stop. Okay. So now let's, and I've told people too that if, if you're in an airplane and it makes a really, really good landing, it wasn't the pilot. <laughs> The computers can actually land the airplane, especially in bad weather, better than the pilots usually. Um, so it's it's. I have a lot of faith in that equipment. And we'll, although I don't think I'd want to be in an airplane with no pilots up front, because I want to know somebody is going to save their own butt before <laughs> mine goes piling into the ground because they're up front. But um, the the technology is there. The technology can do this stuff. So how we we're going to wrap up here pretty quick, but. How, was, how does um, the autonomous driving impact things like car sharing or carpooling or, I mean, because you, you could technically, if you kind of match Uber with a, a car and put it on the road 24, 24 hours and it could drive itself around. In other words, once, you, once it dropped you off at work, it could go pick somebody else up and go do things. Um, should, would that, you know, what's the possibility of, of lumping those technologies together? Yeah, it, the system changes. Are, are massive and and because we're short on time one mind one thing to think about is my car right now if it was a, a smart vehicle that could drive around on its own and, and be the the uber like or taxi like service when i come and park at work in town i work in a in a higher rise building that has 10 stories of parking garage mm -hmm. at the bottom and then another 10 stories of of working levels that car doesn't need to be in there and if everybody else is on the same platform that i am all those cars don't need right. we just switched 10 stories of parking garage that can switch to, mm -hmm. to something else. Yeah. Um, all the roads and infrastructure in downtown would be higher utilized. I, I could easily foresee us switching half of them to bike lanes okay. and, and be a lot like Fort Street Mall. Okay. Well, I, I see that as a whole other show by itself, so we'll probably have to do some more homework on that. Well, thanks for being with Stan the Energy Man and Ryan Woodman today from Burns and McDonald here on Think Tech Hawaii, and we'll see you next, next Friday, right before Christmas. Aloha.